My great grandmother was very fortunate to leave till the age of uh, 102. If it wasn't for her and my grandparents literally raising me from uh, infancy to where I am today, I wouldn't be fortunate to know my language. So I grew up about five years with my great grandma and living with them, residing with them. And she was pretty much the one that had informed me and always taught me that Zuni language is who you are. It's your identity. You should always practice it. As natives, we have our own doings. We have our own different culture. But just try and, you know, speak your own language. Don't be embarrassed. And like I always tell my daughters, is if they, if they, they talk more English, I always tell them that, what color is your, what color is your skin? And they'll say brown. OK, talk your own native then. That's what I kind of emphasized my two girls to, you know, start talking in Zuni's. Zuni's more important language than the outside language, second language. The thing about it is, you know, I'm not fluent in my language just yet, you know. I know all the basic conversation. I know how to carry on a small conversation. I know how to understand conversation, but I'm not completely fluent, you know, with it to the point where I can, you know, make up a prayer on my own. I have prayers that were gifted to me and, you know, that we we learn as children growing up to share with each other and, you know, to share in honor of, you know, the event that may be going on, you know, if somebody's birthday, you know, uh, there's prayers for that. If there's somebody's maybe a funeral, there's prayers for that, you know, and these prayers are learned. And that's another way of us learning our language. So I like to learn a lot of prayers. So I know quite a few prayers, you know, and that's the way I learn my language. We have English as our first vocabulary. We try to learn our language and the only way we can learn it is by interpreting it into English, finding a meaning with English words. And uh, so it's not the full me meaning, but we get a sense of what, what it does mean of how to, how to label things, how to, what to call a tree, a te, you know, a tree, but behind that te, there's way more, it means something that's living, it's something that's, that's part of us, something we come from, and, uh, and it has its own spirit, it's a, so it, it's like that, it would be very hard to resurrect it if we lost, up, lost it all. It would, it would be very hard. We'd have to leave it, leave it in the ground, leave it gone. I have family members who are, who do pottery, and um, the way we take uh, take the natural resources from Mother Earth is we give Mother Earth a prayer in our language um, before we take the clay. The way we were all taught, the way we were all told is, you know, we come from the earth. We came from underneath the ground where we're from the earth. And then when we go back, after we're done with this world, we go back to the earth. So, I mean, to me, we're never ever disconnected from the earth. It's more that if we lose a language, we're more disconnected from our spirituality with the earth, I guess. Before we eat, we give a little piece of what we're eating as an offering to our ancestors. And we say a short word that's like telling our ancestors to eat our offerings. So I think that's how tradition, our language would tie in with Mother Earth is because we have natural resources that go around here in our um, reservation. So dance, of course, in our culture is a form of prayer. Um, and here, um, it's really a form of education. Um, normally, we don't allow filming of dances. Um, here we do because we understand, the dancers understand, that this is a form of communicating to uh, outside communities uh, some of the things and some of the things our culture represents. And we're coming out of the Kiva to do our first dance. 
I had walked out and uh, from what was told to me was the snow was about that high. It was about that high and all the men were ready to dance and I was, you know, the youngest one out there. And my father had me stand by him. He said, you know, come stand by me and I'll watch over you. And so I stood uh, next to him and as the line went, you know, it went straight, straight, and then boom, me, <laughs> and then went back again. And so I danced uh, the whole day like that. And throughout the day, uh, throughout the morning, I should say, the morning segment of it, before lunch, um, my grandmother had been running out into the uh, plaza as we were dancing with the blanket. And she would run up to me, wrap me in it and pull me off to the side. And as soon as uh, she would do that, you know, I would stand there for a little bit, but then I would shake the blanket off and go right back out there and I'll you know, start dancing again. If I was a little girl, my father actually, he's the one who started me out. He took me and my sisters into the Kiva and since then we've been dancing every dance that comes around for the women were out there dancing. And 10 years after that, Ashkia asked us to dance with his dance group. And that's how I started. And I kept continuing it. After that, I just wanted to keep dancing and dancing. It's not, um, if he asks me to dance, I'm not like, okay, I'll think about it. Let me get back to you. No, it's that I want to do it. Every performance we have, I have to be there because I want to be there. It's because I like it, I love it, I love our culture. But our dances and the things we do to bring joy to our people, to pray for long life, to pray for this whole world, will be lost. A lot of our traditional and cultural and religious practices are solely done in nothing but the Zuni language. We can't speak uh, English in a Kiva setting. We can't speak English among the spirit deities that come and, you know, visit us through their pilgrimages. And we can't make our offerings through English prayer. It's what we've been taught as Zunis that we have to utilize our native language to, you know, stay connected with the spirit world and make sure that we utilize that so that our ancestors and our spirit beings can hear us. So native language was something that I was always informed of using for, for these practices and these day-to-day -day things. It's always cool to, you know, utilize our language wherever we're at, you know, because the way I see it, you know, the only language that isn't indigenous is English, you know? So, I mean, why not should we speak all our languages wherever we go, you know, especially here in New Mexico, I mean, from, the Sandias all the way down this way, you know, they can be speaking the Tiwa language and as well as Carriers because you have also the uh, uh, Kewa Pueblo, which is Santo Domingo and uh, San Felipe, which also speaks Carriers. I mean, you would think that in this region, it would be a lot more utilized rather than the English, but you know, just the way that uh, history has played out, you know, we're not in that type of society anymore. But you know, that's the history behind this little uh, area. Is there, this was the language I was utilized and you know, it should be utilized then. And, and I, would, I would actually like to start off by talking about the natives responsibility, not only in keeping that culture and, and teaching everyone uh, that they can the language, but they also need to look for ways to continue to educate the folks outside their communities about their culture. That's exactly what the cultural center here does, is to um, make sure that people understand the importance of what that culture has to offer. Um, so it's our responsibility to teach. It's the responsibilities of non-natives to learn uh, and to understand the importance of it. I really think that a prime example is in Pueblo culture, resilience is, is just, the resilience has been unbelievable. If you think that since time immemorial we've been here and um, we've had occupation by the Spaniards, by the Mexican government, by the United States government, and we're still here and we're still thriving. And one of the reasons for that is the resilience that we have and the resilience com comes from community. If you spend any time in our Pueblo lands, you'll see that uh, people that live there uh, don't really 
look at volunteerism the way everybody else does. It's duty to community. We serve our communities when we're there, um, and it's an important role that everybody has. And so community is almost first and foremost, and then yourself and your family come after that. And that's not practiced outside Indian country very much. I think that's one of the things that Pueblo culture can help the rest of the world understand, that we need to get back to a community-based uh, society, that we look at what's good for the community and, and put us in the back seat. Um, so there's several ways that folks outside the Pueblo communities can learn from us uh, and can support the growth of our culture and the spread, the spread of positive things that our culture has to offer. I would say just try to hold on to your language the best that you can and your culture and maintain it the best of your ability, you know? And that's all of us right now. It's complicated living, trying to live your cultural life and then being a part of the social world, you know? And I think if everybody were to just put their phones away and just listen to an elder speak, go visit their grandparents and their uncles and their aunties and just pick up words of advice in Tewa and just learn their their language through through uh, their elders and, and hope and pray that everything that they teach you will somehow stay in here and you'll prosper a better life. And that's all we wanna do right now is that's our main focus for all of us is to learn our language. And yeah, we understand the language, but we can't keep a conversation back and forth, back and forth, you know? So as harsh as this sounds, um, I think they need to see the the ripple effect happen, like actually have it take place to as if we actually lost our language. And then I think from there on, they'll think like, oh, we should have really talked to our elders and had the, have them teach our um, ha had them teach our language and traditions. So I think they just really have to have it come towards them to see, like, have them realize that they they should have done something before our language and culture and everything went away. I would strongly suggest and hopefully ask that the way society can help with this is to respect that it's a spoken language of a sacred people and a sacred community. Respect, honor, and awareness is what we need in this world because when you talk about Native Americans, you know, like I was saying, a lot of people think it's just the power. And granted, a lot of us do participate in the power. We also have over 500 Native American nations that are in the United States that all sing and all pray and all dance a different way. So if it was, you know, one thing that people can really take back from seeing our dance group and what the world really needs to know is that not to be judgmental towards anyone, you know? We're all different in our own ways, but we're all the same in one way. And that's having this body, you know, this spirit and this mind, you know? We're all still the same person, you know? Genders can be different, names can be different, but we all share one thing and that's a heart. Probably respect the natives of their language and from outside, uh, probably just, you know, have them support and trying to get involved with the uh, reservations and just to see that for us to stay in the reservation as a lot as and generations grew up and see how far the outsiders can, you know, get involved and, you know, like with preserving our language and preserving our culture and just be supportive, you know. It has to be a combined effort amongst teachers and parents that this continue to be taught because as a teacher, I've seen, oh, well, they come to class to learn Zuni language. When they get home, they're stuck on YouTube. They're stuck on their uh, devices. So, you know, that's all they do. 
And so it turns out that teachers are pretty much the only ones that teach the Zuni language now. And so it does make me wonder, but you know, I think if this were to really happen, it would be very scary and it would be a nightmare and a prophecy come true because this is something that's always been foretold by our ancestors. I would say go to the elders, pick up one of our teledictionaries. We do have teledictionaries available. You can easily learn it like that. Keep trying and trying, don't give up. It's possible and you can learn the language if you do try and keep trying. I'm a better person because of Pueblo culture. Um, it, it has taught me a lot and to be um, not, not so self-centered and to think about other things, family, community. Um, so I'm very grateful to have spent the time I have both uh, in, in Laguna and other communities. Uh, I learn, I observe from 19, now being representing 19 Pueblos, I'm able to learn the importance of other uh, cultures besides Laguna. And so that's been an amazing journey that uh, I couldn't imagine being anywhere else right now. It's just, I learn every day different things. Um, so uh, uh, I guess uh, not knowing where I'm headed, what's next, I'll always know that the person I am today, uh, Pueblo culture has, got, has had something to do with that. Whenever our grandkids, not soon, but to teach them the basic life of to, you know, take you from the heart, the values and the heritage and where you're from and, you know, hold on to it. It's, it's nobody else's but except yours. Hold on to it. I think that what it takes is that all of us uh, in the world needs to understand how important saving those cultures are and what the meaning for diversity really is when you talk about culture and different cultures working together. Um, so I think it takes a lot of education, a lot of communication about the importance of language, um, and it takes support from all levels of government uh, and society to say, this is important to us, even though it's not my culture, even though it's not my language, I need to look for ways that um, can really support the preservation of both language and that culture. As a Zuni person, as a Zuni member, you understand that no matter what hardships you go through, as long as you are able to greet the sun on a daily basis, that is your purpose. We never really know what our roads may lead to. Only the Creator knows where we go, how far we venture, what obstacles we go through, and what successes we have in life. We can't determine, despite how many years of school we get, where our roads may lead to. Only He does.
Ferreira.